Today we begin a brand new sermon series entitled, God Has an App for That. As many of you know, there are all kinds of apps. Some of them are to entertain, others are to educate. Apps can also be very helpful in life. Uh, you have uh, LinkedIn trying to find a job, a Twitter, a Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Pinterest, just to name a few. These apps have become a part and parcel of our culture. Since uh, 2007, more than 30 billion apps have been downloaded in the U.S. alone. That's a lot of applications. I want you to consider that when we turn to God's Word, that it addresses virtually everything that we could imagine in terms of the challenges of life. It is the best app in God's Word. In other words, God gives to us wisdom. Wisdom isn't simply the accumulation of knowledge as Webster's Dictionary defines it, but wisdom is knowledge that is applied to life that brings honor and glory to God, it helps us to live well and blesses people all around us. Of course, there is what's known as wisdom literature. We have the Old Testament book of Proverbs. In it, short, pithy sayings of wisdom that guide and direct. Today, we're going to be taking a closer look at the book of James uh, James uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 12, we'll look at verse 1, uh, verses 2 through 4, verses 5 through 8, and finally, verses 9 through 12. Our message is entitled, God Turns Our Stress into Joy. But before we dive into James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, have you ever thought that the people during the Bible days had it easier than us? Have you ever wondered, you know, what's their big problems? You know, somebody um, trying to get their prize chicken back after it got stolen. Uh, maybe uh, they had to grab some extra straw and mud to thatch a, a roof of their hut. Or a person in the marketplace may have had to either, quote unquote, open up their store or close it based on weather conditions. Now, don't get me wrong. I really like modern conveniences. I appreciate indoor plumbing. I like uh, air conditioning, the internet, and uh, drive through Mexican food. Uh, these are things that are very important to me. But there's a part of me that just wonders, would it just been easier for people back in James's day and Jesus's day as they're living their day in, day out lives? I mean, don't you feel like we have so many voicemails on our telephone? a ton of text messages on our cell phone, and our inbox is literally filled to the brim with all kinds of emails. But before we think that life was so simple, and all the people in James's day ate falafel, sat around, and contemplated life, I want you to consider what James chapter 1, verse 1 has to say. It tells us that James is a servant of God, and it says, the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. What does that mean? Uh, basically, these are Jewish people that came to saving knowledge of the long-awaited Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now they are being oppressed. First, they're being oppressed by the Roman Emperor Claudius at the time. Uh, Christians were being beaten, thrown into prison, and in many cases killed for their faith. Not only are they being oppressed by the Romans, but they're getting a second oppression from other Jewish believers, not Christians, but committed Jews. These individuals are angry at this group of people. On top of that, we're noticing that there's division in the church in the first century. Uh, tragically, there are some who are living double-minded lives. They're vacillating between God's word and the word of men. So what we're going to do today is to see this context and how life was not all that easy for these first century believers. Benjamin Franklin is noted as having said there are two things that are guaranteed in life, death and taxes. Might I add that we have a third thing, trials and connected to trials, stress. Every one of us experiences stress and trials. Back to verse 2 in James 1. 
it says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Did you notice that it doesn't say if you face trials, but when you face trials? It also tells us that there are various trials, which implies two things. One, there's more than one, and two, that there's various shapes and sizes of trials and tribulations. I like the way that St. Peter put it in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. In other words, don't be shocked that you're going through a trial or tribulation. In the book of Romans, Paul says it this way, that the rain falls on the just and on the unjust. King David wrote these words, a righteous man may have troubles. Even Jesus warned us in John chapter 16, verse 33. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. Let's do a quick survey. In the last six months, anybody have any stress? In the last six months, have any of you had a trial? In the last six months, have you had a tribulation? Each and every one of us, to one extent or another, can say we've had something happen. Back to James chapter 1, verse 2. Consider pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face various trials, or all kinds of trials. Some of them are big, others are small. In some cases, it's like a fender bender on the highway, but for others of us, it might be a head-on collision. For some of you, you might have a little bit of heartache, but others you are experiencing a full-blown coronary, and it is absolutely overwhelming. Let me talk to you just briefly about some of the things that can cause this stress in our lives. They are overbooked schedules, unavoidable losses in life, a lack of financial provision, and finally ridicule or attack by other people. Let's look at each of these in greater detail. The first cause is overbooked schedules. Anybody here ever try to fit 36 hours of activity in 24 hours? I do that all the time. And as a result, that causes me to feel like I'm overwhelmed by my overbooked schedule. When people ask me during that time how I'm doing, this is my response. I'm crazy busy. And there are times where we get that way, trying to get our kids off to work, trying to go and, uh, not kids off to work, I mean school off. Right? You, you, you got the idea, I'm sure, okay. I was like, no, unless, uh, you know, I think that's a third world country thing. Okay, anyway. So we're getting our kids off to school, going to work, uh, then we run around all day long, then we pick them up, then we go and try to grab dinner, we do chores, we do homework, we do whatever, and it gets overwhelming. We have these to-do lists that are a mile long. In Luke chapter 10, some 2,000 years ago, Martha had a to-do list that was a mile long. Mary was captivated by Jesus' teaching, and she didn't care what was going on, but the other sister was overwhelmed by all the circumstances. So the Bible says this in Luke chapter 10, verse 40. So, Lord, this is Martha speaking, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Doesn't that sound like a sibling? She is ticked off that she's left holding the bag. And then this is, I love Jesus' response in verse 40. 41. Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about so many things. Basically, Jesus is saying, relax, take a deep breath. It's all going to be okay. And then she responds by saying a little bit later that she's overwhelmed. And in verse 42, we see again Jesus's next response. He says, Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. We need to focus on Christ, even in the midst of busyness. The second cause of stress is unavoidable loss in life. You lose a job. Uh, you lose your home. You lose a loved one. When I think about Job and all the tremendous losses that he endured in a very short period of time, I would have thought that he would have cursed God, but he actually praised God in the midst of his suffering. There's a third cause of stress, and that is a lack of financial provision. We have a, a stack of bills this high. Uh, we have found out that our 401k has gone south because of the economy, or maybe we're even facing foreclosure. One of the most stress-filled times in a couple's life is when one person loses their job. 
But this makes me think, what about a single parent who is trying to take care of their children and they don't have that cushion or that support? How much stress must that be on them? So an unexpected financial challenge can really cause a lot of stress. And finally, ridicule or attack by other people. This is something that always surprises me. Every so often, I'll have somebody who comes up to me and they'll say, you know, now that I'm a Christian, I thought all my problems would disappear. And I explain to them um, that we have a resource in Christ, that he loves us, that he guides and directs us, but don't think that you're not going to have challenges because challenges are part of the human existence. These words recorded in Psalm 69 really touch my heart because I think many of us feel this way. The psalmist writes, Save me, O God, from the floodwaters that are up to my neck. Deeper and deeper I sink into the mire. I can't find a foothold, and I am in the deep water, and the floods overwhelm me. Do any of you right now feel like you're in the deep water, and maybe you're in over your head? If you haven't already done so, take out your sermon notes so you can follow along with our morning's message. We're going to look at some of God's practical wisdom or his app for stress, trials, and tribulations in our lives. Also, for those of you who are following along with the message with the Bible, you might want to turn to James chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. In the Pew Bibles, it happens to be on page 1011. Again, that's page 1011. Let's take a look at this first key insight that we are told. Count it all joy. Second, ask God for wisdom and strength. And third, persevere while focusing on the ultimate prize. So let's take a look at it. First, we need to remember to count it all joy. We're going to have good days and bad days, up days and down days, days that things are going right and days where everything seems to be going wrong. It says in the ESV, count it all joy. Another translation says, consider it all joy. Uh, the Greek carries this idea, consider or count it all joy. And it's also sometimes referred to as reckoning. This seems odd, doesn't it? Anybody here, when something really bad happens to you, you're like, yay. Do you feel like that? Do you want to just go up and give people a high five that you just got a, you know, a pink slip? Do you want to go and tell people how excited you are because now you're waiting for a biopsy and you don't know what's going to happen? No. This is something very different. This is a joy, not an issue of happiness. Let me explain what I mean. Joy is internal. Happiness is external. It's based on happenings. You can have this joy, but did you notice to whom this is directed? In one translation, it says brothers. To another, it says brothers and sisters. It's directed to Christians. When you meet trials of various kinds. So there are a couple things that are going on here, and I want you to really kind of see it. For you know that the testing of your faith, so there's testing of faith, that it produces steadfastness, and then later it talks about being complete or mature. So we see three things. One, there's a testing of faith. Two, that there is a producing of the steadfastness or perseverance. And three, that there's a maturity that begins to develop in our lives. But let me ask you, do you know people who have gone through trials and tribulations and they're not really better for them, but they're bitter? Have you met people who don't have a more softened heart, but their hearts seem to be hard towards God? Uh, the other night, I was at a dinner not too far away from here, and I was talking to one of these gentlemen who works at Disney, and he explained that there was a young lady at the work who got hit by a drunk driver while she was walking, and for over a year, she had to relearn how to be able to walk. She has every opportunity to get angry over her circumstance, but this is what happened. She decided to become a chaplain, and she's sharing her story and impacting others with the good message that God can take that which is painful and bring about joy. This is a very important part of the Christian faith. What do I mean by an important part? If you don't get anything else today, but you get this one idea, it's going to be well worth the price of admission. And here goes. God has a redemptive purpose for suffering. 
God has a redemptive purpose for the trials in your life. Out of bad, God can bring about good. From the bad situation, God can give you good things in your life that help you grow in your maturity, in your character, and in your relationship with Jesus Christ. This is so essential to understand that you and I can actually grow through these trials in our lives. And so what I want you to consider is how God continues to do that. This is not a theology of glory, but a theology of the cross. What do I mean by the theology of glory? Nowadays, there's a lot of TV preachers out there, and they are part of what's known as the prosperity gospel movement. It's the health and wealth group that name it and claim it. And they think that as long as I just read my Bible more, if I just pray a little bit more, and then I give uh, more financially to a particular ministry, then somehow God is obligated to give me a brand new Escalade with 20s. Or I'm going to receive that multi-million dollar house, or I'll never have a trial or tribulation with my health in my life. That is not true. Christians suffer, but out of the suffering, God brings good. Let me give you the supreme example. Was it good that Jesus, the sinless Savior of all mankind, went to the cross of Calvary? No. It's a terrible thing that Jesus endured that. But catch this. Out of that, there was redemption. There was the forgiveness of sins. There was new life for all mankind. So God took what was terrible in terms of suffering, and he used it for his glory to draw us closer to him. That's a theology of the cross, not a theology of glory. There's a second truth that I want you to consider this morning. That, oh, let me move. Remember to ask God for wisdom. Remember to ask God for wisdom. Let's turn our attention to verses 5 and 6. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. What is wisdom? Remember, it's the application of knowledge in our lives so that we might bring honor and glory to God, that we might have healthy relationships and be a blessing to others and be blessed as well. Sometimes our prayers are not for wisdom, are they? What are our prayers? God, get me out of this. Instead, we should say, God, what are you doing in the midst of this? What are you teaching me in my life as a follower of Jesus Christ? I think it's so important to understand this. But let's go back to the text and take a look at what he says. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask. Anybody here feel like you need a little bit more wisdom in life? Anybody who's a parent, a grandparent, a great-grandparent? Anybody here ever need some wisdom in how to navigate relationships? You ever need some wisdom when it comes uh, to kind of changing careers or maybe stopping one career and starting another career? God gives, it says, generously to those who ask him. This is absolutely remarkable. Now, I want us to look back at verse 4 and following. So take a look here. He talks about the gift of wisdom. But then in verse 6, he says, but when you ask, you must what? Believe and not doubt. So don't doubt. And then he says, if you doubt, this is what happens in another translation. We read these words. He who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. And then in verse 7, it says, then the man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. Finally, verse 8, he's a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. When I read through verses 6 through 8, it sort of reminds me of a caring parent wanting to give advice to their child. I don't know if you kind of have that sense, but I do. As I read this passage, I think to myself, as a parent, I've experienced some things, and I suspect you have too. And I've gone through the school of hard knocks, and I'm sure each and every one of you has experienced some of those hard knocks as well. But I don't want my kid to have to experience tough times if they don't have to. Have you ever thought that God doesn't want you to go through pain and suffering if you don't have to? He wants to protect you and guide and direct you and bless your life. So, number one, count it all joy, but this is something that comes from the Holy Spirit working through the power of the Word. Second, prayerfully ask God for wisdom and stability in your life. And finally, number three, remember to persevere 
while focusing on the ultimate prize. Remember to persevere while focusing on the ultimate prize. Uh, this is so interesting to me in this next section of Scripture. And it, what's remarkable is starting at verse 9, it talks about that the brother in humble circumstance. So there's poor and rich people in the first century church. This isn't a change of subject. He's talking about trials and tribulations happen to both the wealthy and the downtrodden. And he talks about these humble circumstances. And this is what's remarkable. He's basically saying that people who are poor can be rich in Jesus. And that people, later on he'll say this, that are rich without Jesus, they are poor. And so what I want you to do is consider that these are humble, are you experiencing humble circumstances? Are you going through a trial or testing in your life even now? Overwhelming schedule, problems at work, relational difficulties with your spouse, whatever the case may be. It reminds me of a gentleman who was a boxer. Uh, he was going into the, the first uh, round, and the guy who's the trainer in the corner was rubbing his shoulders and saying, uh, you're going to do great. Just go in there. So he goes in there. He's got his dukes up, and he's ready to fight, but he gets a beating. He comes back, sits down. The trainer keeps rubbing the shoulders and says, you're doing great. The guy hasn't touched you. And he's thinking, what's going on? And he goes in the second round. He gets beat even more than the first. He goes back in the corner. The trainer says, you are phenomenal. He hasn't laid a hand on you. He goes in round three, round four, round five, and he just looks nasty. I mean, he's looking like uh, Sylvester Stallone in the very first Rocky movie with his eyes uh, shut. It's just a bad look. And he says to him, man, that guy hasn't touched you. And he kind of angrily turns to him and says, okay, he may have not touched me, but tell the referee someone's beating the living snot out of me. Sometimes we feel like life beats the living snot out of us. It knocks us down. And that's what he's talking about for the wealthy and for the poor. This is the situation. But this is what I want you to remember, that the same God who saved Daniel will save you. The same God who saved Gideon will save you. The same God who brought life to Lazarus will bring life to your dead situation. But then he goes on to contrast this in verse 10. Let's turn our attention there. But the one who's rich should take pride in his low position. In verse 11, it goes on to say, For the sun rises with the scorching heat, withers the plant, its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. And in the same way, the rich man will fade even as he goes about his business. Isn't that the truth? That no matter how much wealth you have, that it's not going to save you from suffering, from trials, from tribulations. You're going to go through it. Uh, close with me now to verse 12. We're going to look at it here. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trials because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. And God has promised to those who who love him. I want to encourage you to focus on Jesus when you're going through a trial or tribulation in your life. Your focus on Jesus is going to change absolutely everything in your life. Now, many of you know I like cars, right? I loved cars ever since I was a kid and got my very first Hot Wheel it was love at first sight when I saw muscle cars as a seven-year-old kid, and I got a chance to ride around in a 68 Dodge Charger. But I also love car shows. Um, for example, uh, counting uh, cars is like uh, Danny Count. He has a customs. Uh, he has just incredible. I just saw an episode. They redid a 71 Buick Riviera. It's a beautiful car. They'd only made it for a few years. Uh, then another show that was great was uh, on Beach One. It was Pimp My Ride, and it featured Exhibit, uh, the rapper of all people. They would take these really beat down cars and restore them. But my absolute, absolute, absolute favorite car show is this, Overhauling. Over Holland was on two different stations, and what they do is they basically kidnap your car, and then you have it completely restored. But the reason I like it is the reaction of the people. See, they pretend that the car is stolen most of the time. And there was one episode. It had Amber Heard, who's an actress, and at the time she was dating and living with Johnny Depp. 
And uh, she had a beautiful car. It was a 68 Ford Mustang hardtop. It was absolutely beautiful, but it was in terrible condition. Ugh. You would have looked at that car and thought, you know what? She, she's got money. She needs to do something with that vehicle. And then they pretended that it got stolen. She went ballistic because it was the very first car she brought with her when she came to Hollywood. So it had all this sentimental value. And what's interesting is they told her, well, we found it. So they had these people pretend they were the police. But the problem is it ended up in Las Vegas. So she yelled and screamed, at and she said some verbal expletives that I can't share in church. They did a lot of bleeping. And w what happened was, she, all right, just bring it back. She slams down the phone. There's a couple days later, she gets a second phone call, and she's even more irate. She is ticked off. She's yelling. She's screaming. She's throwing every word you could imagine at these people. And they explain, well, it got moved to San Diego by accident. And so you're just going to have to be patient. A couple more days happen, and they explain, oh, it got moved to Orange County. And she's, I mean, you're afraid she's going to hurt somebody. It's really ugly what I'm seeing. It's so weird to see that. And then finally, she sees that they call her, and she's going to go pick up her car in Los Angeles. But here's what's fascinating. She comes up. She has her eyes closed. She opens them, and she's so moved, tears are literally streaming down her face. And the very people that she was cursing are now the very people that she's praising. And I thought to myself, isn't that show just like how we operate with God? We scream, we yell, we curse God and say, God, why did you allow this to happen? And all the while, God is busily doing something so beautiful. When they rolled out her car, I can guarantee you that car never looked as beautiful as it did that day. That's how God works through our pain, our trials, and our sufferings, that he takes things that we don't know that are going on, he puts them together, and they're more beautiful than ever before. I want you to turn your attention finally to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while. If necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 7, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. God is able to take our trials and bring about something beautiful. When you are facing a trial, please understand this. Count it joy because you know that God is working your faith to become stronger, that he's developing character and spiritual maturity in your life. When you're going through these trials in your life, I want to encourage you to pray to God don't say what some people have told me. I've tried everything. I might as well pray. Go and turn to God, and he will give you wisdom. And finally, keep focusing on Jesus when you're going through these trials in your life, because I guarantee you this, that God has an app to turn our sorrow and trials into joy that transforms our lives. Amen? Let's link our hearts together in prayer.